Hello again. We're getting towards the very end and the most painful part of Luke's Gospel. Just another week to go and then it will all be over. And I suppose we'd have said then we've had the worst and yet we'll, and then we'll get the best. But for the moment we're not at that point yet. Let me read you the short extract from Luke's Gospel set for today. It's not easy to contemplate Jesus' situation as he finds himself in the hands and at the mercy of those who hate him. This is Luke 22 verses 63 to the end. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy! Who is it that struck you? And they kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together and they brought him to their council. And they said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. If I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. And then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. The crucifixion makes me weep. I've never been able to bring myself to watch the film The Passion of Christ. Perhaps I should. I had seen Twelve Years a Slave before The Passion came out, and the sheer brutality of that made me cry out in rage and horror. I just felt that The Passion would be much the same. I told myself that I could imagine how horrible the crucifixion was without actually having to witness one, and I assume, with all the clever computer imaging that filmmakers now have at their disposal, that it would indeed be just like watching a real crucifixion. Now, a piece I've just read, an early part of the final phase which culminated in the crucifixion, also enrages me. Such disregard for the humanity and the feelings of another is something I met when I was a deputy head teacher dealing with teenage boys. Well, most of the boys were good lads whose greatest crime was to forget to do their homework or not to do their tie-up properly, but a few were going through a nasty phase. Most would grow out of it, but a small number never did. A few are in prison now for murder. Jesus is the victim of brutal bullying. The nastiness is just getting started. To blindfold someone and then to hit them from all sides, making it a vile guessing game. Who hit you? Is despicable and shows the kind of thugs the Jewish hierarchy employed in, in their henchmen. They, of course, were above that kind of behaviour. They were too sophisticated. Their kind of thuggery was to meet out rough summary convictions. I won't grace their decision with the word justice. Well, what do I do with such an unpleasant reading? It's hardly necessary to urge you to treat other people well. That's what you do, and St Mark's is the family it is, because we all generally look after one another. So I think the only other tack that I can think of to take is to look at how Jesus reacts to what is happening to him. We shall see the same display of calm but not cowed resignation from the time of his arrest up to the time he's led up to Calvary. He's insulted, reviled, falsely accused, assaulted, betrayed, unjustly condemned to a cruel death. Throughout all this, he has shown no anger. The last time he did that, and it was a rare occurrence anyway, was a few days earlier in the temple when he overturned the tables of the traders. At that time he was angry not because of anything done to him but because the place dedicated to the worship of his heavenly father was being desecrated. It's so difficult to emulate Christ fully in any way, isn't it? He is perfection itself and we struggle to meet his standards at every stage. 
St. Paul talks about putting on Christ, about being dead to oneself and living for Christ. But he also says that he does not understand his own flawed behavior. He does the things he doesn't want to do, and he doesn't do the things he wants and knows he should do. Paul is very human, but he is a wonderful example of a human being who strives with all his might to be better and better, running, as he says, the great race, with the prize always in his sights. Today I just want to encourage us to emulate Christ in remembering that we are a people of peace. Sowing discord is not what he aims to do, though he knows that discord will arise because of his announcement of the new covenant with God, which the Jewish hierarchy and scholars will find unacceptable and offensive. I'm not the best example of, of someone who lets the peace of Christ rule in his heart. I sometimes have to own up to what I term the red mist, which is what happens when I lose my cool and my balance in a discussion and start saying wild things which do not help me win an argument. It would happen sometimes in senior staff meetings when I was a deputy head, and it has been known to happen in the ministry team meetings at St Mark's. I suppose it tends to happen, and it is not all that frequent, when my argument is rather weak. I substitute strength of reasoning with increased volume and a rather more aggressive delivery than is my habit. Jesus remains calm but assured in this passage, as he will be in a few hours when he is brought before Pilate. He knows that no one can break through his spiritual armour. He knows he is the Son of God, and as such he is invincible. What they do to his body is but a temporary, if excruciating, interruption to the continuum of his being. Can we remain calm? It's easier for some of us than for others. We all have our own temperaments. None of us can avoid the occasional argument, whether it's with those whom we love dearly or with strangers who have upset us. Deirdre, the girls and I, were on holiday on the Atlantic coast of France a few years ago, in fact 1990 if I think about it, in the Vendée. Our holiday gîte was among pines and along the winding coast road. I didn't mind the inconvenience of having to take the car to go into town to buy the morning baguette or croissant. It was part of the fun. The sand from the seashore had blown right up through the pines and there must have been a fine layer of it on the road surface. As I turned right off the coast road to head into town, a large silver Citroen came towards me on my side of the road approaching the junction and I had nowhere to go. There was a stone wall on my right, yes I was driving on the right, so I applied my brakes and so did the driver of the Citroen, but our tyres couldn't grip the road because of the sand and my near side wing was quite badly damaged. I thank God that on that day I was able to get out of my car, calmly shake hands with the elderly driver who was very shaken, and lead him back on foot the hundred yards or so to our house, where we completed the necessary formalities before we parted company amicably. I resumed my journey into town to buy a baguette and a hacksaw, the latter to cut off part of the damaged near side wing, which was grating against the near side wheel. I tell the story not to hold myself up as an example, but of how Christ's way of peace works. Because there was no confrontation, not between people anyway, the potential stress of the incident was much reduced, and I confess to a sense of satisfaction that I had kept control of myself when an explosion of anger could have been justifiable. Christ's teaching is not just about the next life, the kingdom of heaven. It's about building the kingdom here on earth now. If we can be sources of peace, because Christ wanted us to have peace, to cultivate peace, then we can make our own life and the lives of others better. We diffuse tense situations and breathe a sigh of relief when tension dissipates. I think our faith can help us develop an extra layer of calm and peacefulness. If we remember that our Saviour and our Master came to bring peace to all humankind. As his disciples, we follow his lead whenever we can. It's yet another way in which we can sometimes make people wonder what drives us. We may get a chance to explain that our example is Christ and that living the way he taught us, far from bringing us sorrow, has brought us far more joy. It's one reason for wearing a cross which can speak for us without the need for a conversation. A prayer of St Francis now, a prayer for peace, 
partially remembered, you'll remember, by Margaret Thatcher when she was first elected Prime Minister. She wasn't absolutely word perfect, but it was still a good prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offence, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives, it is in self-forgetting that one finds, it is in pardoning that one is pardoned. It is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Amen.